Hey, welcome everybody. My name's Timmy Gibson. Welcome to the Timmy Gibson Show. My special guest today is Jessica Alstrom, and she is uh, got a master's degree in biochemistry, so she's super smart. And uh, she specializes. She's a life coach and specializing in PTSD mm -hmm. and trauma. Which is what I want to interview her about and talk to her about. So, welcome to the Timmy Gibson Show. Yeah, yeah thank glad. you for having Absolutely. me. Absolutely, thanks yeah. for being on here. Finally, nice to get out of the house. I know <laughs> we've been in quarantine for like three weeks. Three weeks. Make sure we're all so, safe. Yeah, yeah. Walk so, no more than just two people. We're abiding. We're, we're by, a good. Three we're about. Feet. Yeah, we're. Good. <laughs> don't cross this line. Our hands I mean, were all washed. Don't cross my line. That's right, and don't try to kiss me. Let's I, keep. The <laughs> Trust me, we're good. No, for real. You know, welcome to the show. I'm glad you're here. And um, I am super fascinated with <clears throat> dealing with childhood trauma and, mm -hmm. and my own um, childhood trauma that I, that I went through, which wasn't severe, like what your story is, which we'll get into. But um, just having, you know, gone through a couple divorces as a kid and mm -hmm. being uncertain about who my you know, male role model was going to be, and then, you know, just experiencing the death of my sister and the death of my grandpa. I mean, there's certain things in my life and my biological father that passed when I was 21. So I, I really am fascinated and very interested in, in what you do and your work with um, you know, people with PTSD and, mm -hmm. and trauma. So what what are some of the steps? Well, first, let's, let's talk about, so what got you into this? What Trauma. What you... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I truly believe that if you had a childhood, you have trauma. You know, you have some 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 layers of PTSD. And now, now I'm not really big on labels because I think we can hide behind labels and we can kind of use them as a crutch to play the victim. Yeah. But um, I mean, even the reason I got into science in the first place was um, because I was the tragically abused child. You know, um, you know, had the the very unaware, um, very unaware mother. And, you know, she did the best she could. I'm not going to throw her under the bus because I've already kind of moved past that. But she was my abuser. And it was really about um, so much emotional rejection and abandonment and, you know, different father figures coming in and out, moving several times. I'm 44 years old. I've moved 58 times. Most of those were in my childhood. Like up in the middle of the night, we'd move. So if you understand childhood, you know, the, the, the real healthy bond of a child is to have roots and wings, which mm. means enough freedom for them to express their identity, but also roots to bring in that kind of core safety. Didn't have either one of those. So wow. like lack of freedom, but then also a lack of roots. And it, it really does mess with your perception of reality. I was also told a lot as a kid, and you're sure, maybe you're familiar with this, especially in our kind of generation, was the way they parented was duress, kind of that militant, yeah. pressurized, like force. And then right after, you know, smack you or tell you you're not worth it or you're no good, then the I love you follows that. Yes. So I if, do this because I love you. I do this because I love you or I love you and I'm sorry. So looking at a child's brain the way that they operate, they're really in this sponge-like place. It's this theta, theta brainwave, which is basically just about duplication and understanding without a lot of judgment. So they're just taking it in, taking it in. So until they're seven years old, we're just a byproduct of whatever we're around. And we're not here to judge when we're kids. We're here to observe. Yeah. We're here to watch. We're here to study. We're here to, to mimic, right? Yeah. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing basically love is pain. So that downloads into my subconscious. And then, you know, I dust myself off and I get tough and I get strong and I leave my house and, you know, I go to school and I pursue relationships. And which relationships do you think I pursue? Right. The painful if, one. If my biological standpoint of my subconscious says love is pain, you better believe I'm going to be highly attracted to painful situations. Mm. And if you're you're looking at your life right now, you can look and see where you're like on that hamster wheel, like, oh, this is still painful. This is, I'm still attracting the same type. I'm still in that same situation. So regardless of the trauma, because a lot of people come to me and be like, oh, I had a great childhood. I'm like, mm. yeah. well, you know, to me, I was the middle child. So if you have kids or have been around kids, not getting the right color cup you know, your brother gets the blue cup, you get the red cup, you wanted the blue cup, 
mom loves you more, mom loves him more. Right. So now you're traumatized. So maybe you didn't get beat up or threatened right. or, you know, molested, which, you know, one in four, right? right? And it's not like it was intentional by the parent to you know, traumatize we're people. we're always doing, just, I think as parents, because I'm a mom, we're always doing the best we can from where we are. Yeah. From our level of consciousness, from what we've been taught, what we believe, you know, our level of fear, our level of lack. You know, if we're lack and we're stressed out, we're going to push that. We're going to project that unwillingly on everyone around us. You know, I think what I've noticed as a trauma specialist is we treat perfect strangers better than we treat our loved ones. Yeah, and that's fascinating. Because we can kind of, we're, we're more unconscious in our intimate situations and we tend to like, pull the mask off and all the pain kind of comes out on everybody else. And because there's an unconditional space there, we don't try yeah. to hide our trauma. And so what I do when I'm working with someone is I find out what's going on now. You know, I'm not like, tell me about when you were five, because that will come up. Right. I want to know where your trauma from your first seven years is still manifesting itself now. Right. And some That's, kind of unhealthy behavior. And, and I'll find it in five minutes of your story. And yeah. where I look for trauma is in four areas. Time, like is time your warden? Do you have like issues with time? Are you pissing away time? Are you don't have enough time? There's wounding there. Time is about creating, it's about freedom. So I can find wounding right there. Interesting. Okay? So like if someone runs late all the time. All the time. What's that mean? Well, that's usually a tantrum of not having enough personal freedom. Yeah. So then we're all basically children. So unconsciously, they're going to demonstrate that is in trying to take their time back. You see how everything is about balance in the universe. So if I didn't have enough time, I'm going to try to, through a tantrum, unconsciously apologize for it, but be chronically late. Oh, fascinating. It is. It's so fascinating. So if, in, growing up, if time was taken from you... Mm -hmm. You'll take it back somewhere else. You'll take it back it's somewhere It's always like victim-perpetrator. So if you were like the victim as a child, you'll notice as an adult, you're unconsciously perpetrating. Like you're pushing that pain to try to balance yourself. Because in nature, we're always trying to find harmony. Yeah. So within yourself, if there's something that's really out of balance, you'll notice that you go to one extreme or another. I call it the starving effect, right? So it's like if you're under-nurtured, you're going to tend to over-nurture, like I did as a parent. Yeah. Like I was a young mom, so I was over-nurturing, and then I was like, whoa, I'm out of balance here, you know, because that's just as traumatic sure. to be over-nurtured. So like OCD, that's the, the, the need to be in control, organized control. What that means subconsciously is I feel completely out of control. Right. So I'm finding harmony outside of me. Interesting. Right? Arrogance is insecurity. Right. So I'm arrogant on the outside, but what I'm hiding is my insecurity. See how I'm finding balance? I'm, right. I'm the victim and the child. So when I'm working with trauma, I'm always looking at what the personality identification is in their time, relationships, health, and money. Because I can find trauma with money. Okay. Their relation. We're, this is a relationship universe. Right. So I'm having a relationship with money. Right. I don't have money. I have a relationship with money. It's a give and flow. It's like breath in and out. It should flow in and out. If it's not, if I'm hoarding it, what does that mean? Right. I can find a childhood trauma there. Yeah. And because, if I'm spending everything. Right. And then that means something. Right. Exactly. I don't deserve it. I got to get rid of it. I got to get rid of it before someone takes it or someone uses it or someone just wants me for my money. I can find traumas in money there. And I'll say the number one holy grail trauma is relationships. Right. Which is why I came to you, yes. right? <laughs> the relationship guru. So for me, it's like money, I cleared it. Time, got it down. Figured out the body stuff because I actually manifested an autoimmune disease and back in um, early 2000s, and it was fibromyalgia. And if anybody's familiar with that one, it's a doozy because it is basically your body just goes in excruciating pain all the time for no reason. It just turns on yourself. And the yourself. doctors cannot find anything. Right. To me, as a biochemist, I'm studying this subconscious, unconscious immune system attacking itself. What's the metaphor of that? I'm attacking me. So I realized that my autoimmune disease was created out of self-hate. So many years of 
trying to prove myself to the world and be a mom and be a wife and, you know, be this person that everyone wanted me to be. And I, I couldn't live up to anybody's expectations. I turned on myself. Right. Right. Wow. And when I turned on myself, that's when immediately I got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, which they said was completely uncurable. And I said, no, this is in the subconscious. This is in the unconscious. This is in my subatomic structure, my blueprint, and I'm going to find it. So that's actually how I started coaching was for completely selfish reasons. Yeah. I wanted to heal myself. I wanted to get to the bottom of it. I knew that if, if it was broke, I could fix it. Yeah. I know the body is designed to heal. I know if I cut my arm, it's going to heal if I leave it alone. But with trauma, we don't leave it alone. Right. We keep opening the Picking wound, it. opening the wound, and we do it in so many different areas. And, and the, the difficult part about trauma is it's always in your blind spot. Yeah. Because you've been building layers and layers and layers of masks over it so that you don't have to feel it. You're always trying to outrun it to the next relationship, the next house, the next job, whatever addiction That's you're say in. The next addiction. That, and avoidance. Avoidance and addiction is the number one thing that we do that actually feels quite exciting. Yeah. And um, I have a workshop called the I Am Workshop, and we look for addictions in the things that are super, super exciting. And we look for the for the things that we're avoiding in our lack of procrast or motivation and procrastination, okay. so we can find all of our wounding in our behavior. Right. In your behavior right now lies all of your trauma, and it's easy to find when you look at it differently. Sure. But you've trained yourself to not look at it. Right. So then, when someone pushes your buttons and triggers you. You get mad at the person who triggered you, and all they did was give you this gift of saying, "Oh, here's your trauma." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was buried, but I, I pushed the button. I, yeah, I, I stepped on that grenade, and <sighs> right, and you're like, "It's your fault. I'm unhappy." No, I just uncovered it. Yeah, because you're never upset for the reasons you think. You're, sure, it's always some buried, especially if it's a big trigger. Right, like tone of voice. You're probably familiar with this in yeah. relationship coaching. Right, tone of voice can fire a whole volcano within right. someone because the tone, the frequency of the way something is said, like passive aggressively yeah. or in denial or rejection or abandonment will trigger wounding that has nothing to do with the conversation you're having. Yeah. So how do you help um, clients? Like what are some of the practices that you use or some of the techniques rather that you use to begin to kind of peel away those layers? Well, I do what's called quantum life coaching, and and basically what that means is I'm a renegade. I'm going to use everything and anything to work with my client. I, I don't have like certain set modalities. I will use any and all depending on what I'm dealing with. So anything from conscious state of quantum hypnosis, I'll use breath work, I'll use um, deep trance meditation and guidance. Um, I'll use energy practices, uh, energy work, right? Uh, I do a lot of like emotional coaching. And then I have a process which I call time travel, which actually takes, takes them back to the root of, of the moment. And we find it through a state of hypnosis. And then what we do is we change the biochemistry in the story through the coaching process. Because if you look at something in the body and it's negative, yeah. and I bring a positive to it, what happens? It Spark. neutralizes. Oh, okay. It creates a neutrality. Neutrality, law of attraction is not listening to. But a positive or a negative law of attraction is listening to, which means if I have negative emotion in my body, it's electromagnetic. So law of attraction is responding to my emotion that I don't even know is there right? and is bringing me bittersweet manifestations, right? So like I finally manifest the job I love, but the coworker from hell, right? Right. It's always like something that creates that bittersweet. And whenever I say that, I'm like, you have trapped emotion. The law of attraction always says yes. So it's saying yes to the, the, the painful emotion and the positive emotion. And you're getting the big mixed bag of nuts, right? So we've got to find both of them, the positive and the negatives, and we neutralize them in the body. Because most of the work that we've done on our journey has been a lot of spiritual work. Right. Right? We found our higher connection. We've found, you know, we've, we've connected with the Holy Spirit or whatever you want to call it. But the missing piece is the body. 
And yeah. most of the, the body pain and illness and chronic emotional stress and depression and anxiety and panic attacks and anger are coming from suppressed emotion, which is energy in motion that's trapped in cells and muscles and organs yeah. of the body. Because I've heard it's a scientific fact that everything that's ever happened to you is stored in your body, mm -hmm. in the cells of your body. Yeah, your cells are like perfect little CDs and they record everything all day, they never turn off. So that means you're watching something, you're downloading it. You're asleep, it's downloading. You're having a conversation, it's downloading. You're witnessing someone else experience something, it's downloading. The brain doesn't know the difference between imagination and real, so it downloads everything and then it summarizes it and it gives you belief system. Your belief system gives you your reality. Your reality is something that you see through your filtered system. So now your eyes can only see what you believe. Right, and perception becomes your reality. Right. And then you will literally buy into whatever you chronically believe. It could be completely not true. And I've studied this a lot. You know, you take two siblings that were raised by the same exact parents. They have a completely different set of traumas. Right. How is that? Because they're having a different perception of reality. They have different behavior, different wounds, different traumas. They've seen the world through a different senses. So then they duplicate it differently. Right. So like my younger brother, four years younger than me, he grew up the same way as me in a very dysfunctional, very, very abusive home. And his solution to our reality was to take drugs. And he started taking drugs at 13 years old and was on meth by the time he was 14. And, and I chose science because I was like, I want to know what the heck is wrong with me. Yeah. Like, I want to know why I feel crazy, why I don't feel like, why I don't feel love, why I don't feel connected, why I feel like a black sheep, why I feel different. He said he felt different, but the way he expressed his difference was to check out and mine was to check in. Right. So when we're looking at siblings and we're looking at dynamics and we're looking at relationships like a oh, husband and wife when I do marriage counseling I don't know how you do it but I do it separately I do the male and the female separately or the female and the female separate different sessions and I ha make sure that they are not in the same room when we're coaching mm. because what I've noticed is their perception of reality needs to be their perception of the reality in the session not the coercion or the the entangled the entangled because I, I feel like when you get married, you create your own consciousness. It's like, you know, you, you hear people say your two names together, like, oh, Ben and Jen, right? Yeah. And it's like all of a sudden you're no longer an individual. Right. You're like this entangled being and there's no you anymore. Yeah. And you is short for universe. So that means that I don't have my own story anymore. Right. So when I'm doing that coaching, it's like, I want to know what your trauma is. And usually it's interesting because the things like that attract us the most within people is our traumas. Fascinating. Right. So if I have abandonment issue, you're going to have a commitment issue. Right. Because you're going to need to abandon me. Right. <laughs> and I'm going to need to reject you to prove to you that you shouldn't commit. Right. And then we can go, see, this doesn't work. Right. But all we're actually doing is being attracted to our own trauma. Why are we attracted to our own trauma? So that we can be aware of it. Right. Now, what, what about when people, they say, I'm nothing like my dad or I'm nothing like my mom. And it's like they're focused so hard on not being like <laughs> that person that it's almost like they are becoming exactly like them. Well, there's a very strong principle in the law of physics that says what you resist, you get. Right. Right. So the more you resist something, the more you become entangled with it because what you reject actually binds you to. It's almost like the thing that you despise the most about yourself or others, you will draw to you because in the universe, there's only yes. Yeah. So law of attraction is saying yes to no and it's saying yes to yes. So if you're saying, no, no, I don't want to be like my mother, you're going to be like your mother, like me. I was like, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to be an educated woman. I'm going to have the handsome prince. I'm going to have the kids, you know, later in life after I'm this scholar. <laughs> no, I mean, two marriages later, you know, four kids. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm becoming my, 
<laughs> My, wow. You know, but not the abusive stuff. Sure. But definitely you follow patterns because of genetics. Yeah. Right? You, you, this is what I always say. You are like your family until you become the creator of your own reality. Right. And when you take over that role, when you take over that role and you kind of step in and you become present and you take responsibility for everything that's compiled in there, then you no longer vibrate everybody else's stories. But yeah. until then, you absolutely will, especially when you're unconscious, you slip in and all of a sudden dad starts coming through, mom starts <laughs> coming through and you're like, you sound just right. like your dad. Like, no, I don't. <laughs> well, it's, it's, that, so it's like what Bruce Lipton uh, teaches about epigenetics and, mm -hmm. and it's the the first seven years of, of pro. Yep programming we're pre-programmed like you said we're, we're in theta brain waves and so we just receive 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 yep. which then leads to subconscious most uh, at least from what i've learned is that most people live from the subconscious the pre-programming and we have to consciously become aware to go ah i don't want to live that way right or i don't want to live based on my trauma i don't want to live this victim mentality and it's not even it's it, well it's not conscious it's it's this subconscious. Uh, it's like when you're driving a car. Have you ever had you know driving on the road and you have someone in the car and you're chatting? Next thing you know, you're home. And right. You, you don't even remember right. the trip. Right. It was just on, you were on, yeah. Your subconscious. You were just on autopilot. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times we live by this autopilot um, way. And for me, when I went through and, and did the breath work um, mm -hmm. with with Dr. Laura uh, Wolf. Um, I'll be honest. I thought I was like, eh, "This is gonna be a little, bit, a little kooky," you know. I mean, I was like, "This is. is gonna be wooey." And it is. And yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> it is weird and it's awesome yeah. at the same time. And so I was, I was a touch skeptical, but I was desperate. You were ready. I was ready. I was ready, and I was desperate. You're ready. And so I'll never forget when we did the the childhood wounding stuff, um, which you know I wasn't like physically abused. It wasn't an an outwardly abusive situation. Uh, but, you know, by the time I was seven, I had three dads, and so that's traumatic. Anyway, mm -hmm. so when when we went through a little bit of a breath work and a little bit of a quasi-hypnosis, she then said, she sat a chair in front of me, and she said, you know, 10-year-old Timmy sitting right here, and yeah. I mean the emotions, like, just, it, yeah. I couldn't control it. Yeah. Like, I lost my stuff yep. and was sobbing good and i was freaked out by it a little mm -hmm. bit like what like what is happening to me man and, up, man <laughs> up. <laughs> come on timmy get tough <laughs> bury that stuff <laughs> bury that stuff and of course she you know she encouraged me to to not bury it that's what i had been doing and she's like let let that you know let all that emotion come yep, up let it come i just didn't realize it was down there well of course I had buried it so deep and I yeah. guess had so many walls. Yeah. So I work in the system of me, myself, and I. So conscious awareness, subconscious awareness, unconscious awareness. Okay. Now, 95% of you is subconscious, right? You, you just pro autopilot, like brush your teeth, get up, personality, drive, right? You're doing all these things that your body knows how to do intuitively without you necessarily needing to be consciously directing, like tying your shoes. You know how to have a relationship. You know who you're sexually attracted to. You don't actually have to think about these things because your body's like, we got it. We got it. We got yeah. it. 95%, which is a huge amount of your energy. Okay? So 5% of you is consciously deciding and choosing. So that doesn't give you a lot of firepower right. if you've got a subconscious and unconscious that's loaded with outdated programs and belief systems and traumas that you believe are your personality. When people say, this is just how I am, I'm like, not really. Yeah, that's you know, how your subconscious it's is. It's who you've been programmed to be through society and observation and practice. You, you become that, but it's not necessarily your natural state because naturally, our natural state, believe it or not, is joy. Right. Like joy. Total, complete. And that's not in the moment of a one minute. It's like, if you if you don't believe me, go watch a child that is, is healthy and secure and a good family and just watch them. They are literally more excited about bubbles than you and I would ever be about a brand new home or a car. Right. They're like bubbles, you know, <laughs> and it's just organic. It's yeah. so pure. And you watch them and you're like, I've never been that happy ever. Right. right. But it's that natural state. 
So we've got to go in, we've got to make the unconscious subconscious conscious. And the way that we do that is through being present, through talking to ourselves, through bringing our energy inside instead of projecting it outside all the time. We live in comparison, we live in envy, we live in struggle, we live in work. And if we would just turn it around and be like, instead of comparing myself to you, I'm going to find out about me. So it's the study of you. It's self-realization. And it's this process of going in and why do I do that? And, and do I even enjoy that? And, right. you know, I remember when I moved to Kansas City, I had gone through a divorce, the real estate market crashing. I literally flatlined. I lost everything. I lost my house, my cars. I moved from California by myself with three little girls. I had $90 to my name and I had no idea what color I liked. Yeah. I had no idea what music I liked. I knew what my husband liked. I knew what my parents liked. I knew what my clients liked, but I had no identity outside of that. So I had to learn me. Yeah. So my coaching practice is the study of you. And I'm holding space, showing you those blind spots, pushing you into those dark demon corners that you don't want to go and facing the shadows of the parts of you that you've denied, rejected, and abandoned, right. disassociated from. And put those pieces back together because when you leave them behind, people always say, oh, I got ghosted. I got ghosted. I got ghosted. And that metaphor to me, you manifesting it because you're ghosting yourself somewhere. Interesting, yeah. You are literally leaving a part of yourself behind because you don't think you're good enough. You don't think you deserve it. You don't think you're worthy of it. So on the outside, you try for perfection to try to find that balance. Right. And you, how, and when you came from California, when did you move here? Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. So, oh, this was after the big housing. Oh yeah. Crisis. I was in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good times. <laughs> that was a big deal. I had, I had I had friends that lost everything. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. I believe everyone, everyone in their life should have a rock bottom. Yeah. Because it's like I agree. I agree. Because yeah, it what just, is it? Socrates says, the most important thing: know thyself. Right. And in the. Yeah. Dirt is when you really... Well, think about it. We're always keeping our head above water like this in our adult years when we have no, when we have no self-awareness training. So think about it. Rock bottom, you know, when you dive down to the bottom of the pool, you got leverage. Mm -hmm. You could bring yourself back up. Yeah. But not if you're floating. You're yeah. going to get tired. You're going to drown. So it's almost like the rock bottom is like the weight of your whole life just anchoring you down until you just can't breathe. And then all of a sudden that power within you comes back inside and gets you back online and you start remembering and, and a lot of times you have to lose material possessions people places things in order to remember yourself yeah because those are all masks that we can wear really easy and i think that's perfect metaphor of what we're all experiencing right now with this yeah. this kind of virus that's acting as a metaphor of getting rid of all the non-essentials yeah. so that we can get back to ourselves and i think the thing that needs to be born right now is creativity yeah. Because boredom, right? Loneliness inspires self awareness. It inspires intuition. Yeah. And that's when all the beautiful music is made and the paintings. I mean, think about it. You look at the music back in the day, probably because they were bored stiff. Right. Right? Yeah. They didn't have <laughs> a huge social life. Yeah. You know, I mean, ladies would sit there and pose for a painting for like. 38 hours, that means they have no life. <laughs> right? They just had time. They got nothing to do. Now we have the time. Yeah. So I get to draw you later, right? Yeah. <laughs> See, that's the thing that I, I agree. I think that this whole COVID-19 mm. experience that we're having is is an opportunity for us to get back to ourselves. Yeah, get back to ourselves. And, and we're being forced to do it. I know yeah. sometimes, and I've even heard doctors say that sometimes – you can get the flu because of you've run yourself ragged and your body is like, I'm shutting you down so you can rest mm -hmm. and, and stop running the, in the treadmills, right. you know, to, to slow your, you're in the you're rat race. You're always going to manifest what you need to stop you from going where you're not supposed to go. Yeah. You know, it's like when your parents send you to your room, you know, or you get grounded or something. That's no different than getting in a car accident. It's like, there, there needed to be something that interrupted the pattern and place that you were heading. Mm. And it's usually like you're like, everything's a metaphor. So it's like, if you get in an accident, it's like, you're a walking accident. You know, it's like, yeah. there's, there's something inside of you. That's not right. You need to be more present. You need to pay attention. You need to take care of your body. You need to take care of your family. You'll notice like everything starts to become 
like important again when you have a near death experience. It's like, oh, I love my family and I love.、It. It's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Where were you before the accident? Right, right. Not present. Yeah. So it always takes. Unfortunately, we're very stubborn creatures, humans. Yeah. So our first teacher is always pain. Yeah. Don't you wish you'd learn more from? From love, love, and yeah, joy. Yeah, but that's <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately it's not the way it works. But I mean, again, I think I think the generations are changing because I mean, I know your children were raised with love.、Mm -hmm. I know my children were raised raised with love. So、yeah. I think this paradigm is ending.、Sure. I really do because、yeah. my kids were not abused. You know, we didn't have much, but they were like loved to the point where they were like. Get away from me, Barnacle! <laughs> stop like, with the stop love. Stop loving me, right? <laughs> right?、Yeah. But because of that, they're very loving and they're very cuddly and they're very social and they're very aware. And, yeah, well adjusted. And, yeah, yeah. And, and and that that makes me happy that I can kind of break that pattern because who knows how long you know children should be seen and not heard and don't feel that and don't say that and don't think that and don't look like that and. You know, it's like we had to come and break that. Yeah, I think people in their thirties, forties, fifties, sixties are the ones who are like, no more. Yeah, we're ending this story. We're we're taking care of this lineage issue. We're we're you know, kids are always going to have their own trauma、yeah. because I think that you need to acquire some density and some shadow in order to really develop yourself. Because like even in this painting, you see the contrast of the colors. If it was all one color, it would not be interesting at all. Right. But the contrast of dark and light in the shadows is really a fascinating way to develop character and courage. Yeah. So, like my son, he has you know he has a dad, and his dad doesn't have the same beliefs as me. He's not on the same journey as me. He parents very differently than me. He's very militant. He kind of has a tendency that unconsciously parent through kind of humiliation, like. You know why are you doing that? That's you're stupid. You know, and we don't realize that that's a form of abuse. He's not doing it because he doesn't love him. He's doing it because that's the best he can do.、Right. And for so long, it broke my heart because I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm the hippie mom, so my son has to go and face that, and it's my fault. And then I thought, no, this is my son getting an opportunity to experience contrast, and he gets to decide, discern, and choose who he wants to be in that environment. And then in my environment, he gets to decide, choose, and discern who he wants to be in my environment, and he is going to be very well adjusted because the world is not full of hippies.、Right. It's full of contrast. Right. And you're not going to have a hippie boss. Right. So you're going to learn how to deal with the contrast. So it's almost like it's an integration place. It's like a place to kind of go out there and get triggered and get humiliated and and get beat up in the world, and then have a safe space to come back to and be like. How did I feel about that? Right. You know, because we're really big on feelings in my house.、Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you're feeling right now. How are now. you feeling? <laughs> and that's one of the things I, I think that's important with a relationship. You know, you talked about、um, the interaction between a, a, a husband and wife, or boyfriend girlfriend, or girlfriend girlfriend, whatever. Yeah.、Um, is the best kind of relationship is where I've done my healing work and they've done their healing work, and we're we're two. Healthy people, not perfect, but two healthy people that are coming together,、uh, and it's not based upon all the wounding. Well, it can't be based upon need. So every relationship that's in crisis right now is codependent. Yeah. Right, and it's not codependent for what you think. It's not just like oh, he makes the money. It's codependent on emotional needs, physical needs, chemical needs. Codependency. Anytime there's need, there's going to be rocky energy in a relationship because need implies lack. So if I need you, that means I am not self whole. Right. Therefore, I have a hole and I need you to fill it. And you're a guy, so you're going to screw up. Right. Right. Yeah. You're going to, and you don't read my mind the way I want you to. So you're going to be in trouble for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like I always say, women are crazy. <laughs> We have sixty thousand more thoughts. She said it, not me. Sixty thousand more thoughts a day than men. Men are like, yeah, no. Women are like, maybe sideways, backwards. You know, they think about it and then they think about it and they think about it. And we've imagined twenty-five scenarios based on one thing you said, and now you're in the doghouse because of scenario number sixteen. Right. Right.、Yeah. And you're like, I didn't even say that. Well, well, I thought that. Therefore, you're in trouble. Yeah. So. Uh, an unhealed woman will destroy a man,、yeah. because we're going to put all of our issues and make it your responsibility, 
while we have a tendency to rescue you and overgive you, yet also Become block, our mamas. And also block receiving because receiving is not safe because then it implies that I'm weak and that, that, that I need you and, and that now it's conditional and there's an agenda. So I don't want to receive, but I want you to give to me, but I actually don't want to receive. There's this like weird game yeah. that goes on. I've experienced that yeah. with, with women. They, they don't want me to... I don't need... Like, I right. don't need you to rescue me. I don't need you. Right. But like, I want you to rescue me. Right. It's like a double woozy. Yeah. Like, and men, emotionally unavailable. That's the number one thing that I see in, like, the, the dating world out there. And even in relationships, it's the woman is perpetrating her emotion, pushing yeah. it on you or the man. And the man is going, yeah, I'm not ready to feel that. So I can take action. I can, you know, who's asked you want me to kick, right? right. Or what light bulb do you need me to change? But I, I'm not going to sit and feel my feelings with you. Right. And I'm actually not going to tell you my feelings because then that makes me weak. Yeah. And it makes me vulnerable. And what women want is vulnerability. Right. Right. But they're being too vulnerable. It's almost like the unhealed woman lacks a backbone. And she's too vulnerable. She's too giving. She's too nurturing. And a man is too unnurturing and un. So it's like this, and it's like both of them want from the other person for them to kind of fill the gap. And it's it's an impossible journey because it has to be done within. It's almost like the perfect relationship is like a cupcake, the cake and the icing, right? right. Not you mixing your ingredients in with me because yeah. then we lose our own unique perspective. Right. So I, I don't see relationships ever working if the work isn't being done on self yeah. and self-love isn't present and f responsibility for our own wounding. Like one of the things that I love in, in, in the work that I get to do is work with relationships and one of the love languages that should exist is to really kind of lay out like, okay, these are the things that trigger me and this is how I'm working on it. Like, these are the things that I'm very vulnerable about. These are the things that I'm insecure. And lay everything out on the table. And and then when someone violates that or, or triggers that, then you can remind them and you can work together so that the person is actually holding space and is compassionate mm. for you. And Because and, what happens is they jump into defense. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean to. And I didn't do it on purpose. And of course you didn't. Right. But you still hurt me. Yeah. So it's, I mean, if you're going to jump into a relationship where one or the other person isn't doing self care work it's not gonna work yeah bottom line yeah and that's it's, just doomed. Science. it's doomed to fail it, because uh, eventually unconsciously i'm going to start puking up my trauma on you the second we get comfortable and i call it the three month curse yeah three months right after three get months past the, those three months the, the mask starts to fall off right the eye twitching <laughs> <laughs> the OCD, the messiness, the truth the secrets, starts to come out. Right? The unfinished business inside, the body problems, it all like, because love, it's interesting. When you're in love or like the newlywed effect, you're in this vibration where everything is blissed out. Mm. And it's interesting, the things you usually break up over are the things that you were endearing in the beginning. Like, oh, it's so cute that he does that. And then you're like, he does this. Yeah. And it's over. <laughs> right at the yeah. end. Yeah. It's like, I can't. It's like, oh, I love her strength. And then she's like, okay, no. Now she's, she's just too bossy she's too or whatever. too bossy, right. Yeah. So you have to look at those three months because the mask will fall. The trauma will rise. And then if there's real love, if there's a real connection in both Partners can be physically responsible, the ability to respond for their own messes, then they can walk side by side, yeah. but they can never complete each other. It's sure. impossible because this right. is my universe, this is yours. It should. It works like this, and it's tragic. If it works like this, when you kind of meet in the middle, uh, then it like sails. Yeah. Right? I've always taught that when, when I've heard people say, well, I... I just lost myself in the relationship. Or I've, I like, and, I've done that and, many and, times. Yeah, that's an unhealthy. I always so say, times. oh, you should find yourself in a relationship, not lose yourself. <laughs> right. um, but you know, whenever that's secret. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. part of, I mean, even for me personally, you know, my my personality is I'm very in touch with my feminine side, so I'm very in touch with my emotions. I'm typically pretty vulnerable, um, especially after all the the trauma work that I've done mm -hmm. now. Um, you know, I, I can be vulnerable. I can quickly be vulnerable, um, but you know, in the dating world, which you, you know, I mean, it's like, 
the games you play and the、oh, you know all which I hate. It's exhausting, and it's it feels so disingenuous. It's it's like I want to text them, but I don't want to text them and let, let them think I really care about them. So I'm gonna wait on that text for a couple hours,、oh, and that. But it's high school, right? right. It's like, are we in junior high again? And again, not that you're gonna go on the first date and by the end, you know, whip out a ring and say, you know, get down on your knee and be like, "Will you marry me?" You know, I'm just in love with you. That's when you get ghosted. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's when ghosting happens. <laughs> And just so you know, I keep reaching up here because I apparently did not set the、uh, timer on my computer, and so it, it's trying to go night night. Yeah, the, the, the screen's going <laughs> night night. It, fortunately, it's still recording.、Um, so there was a, a a book that a dear friend of mine gave me, and I want you to talk about、um, this book. You're the one that gave it to me.、Uh, you gave me this book. It's called The Little Soul and the Sun. It's、uh, a children's parable adapted from the Conversations with God, which、mm-hmm. uh, I have heard a lot about、uh, by Neil Donald Walsh.、Mm-hmm. This book, <laughs> I've read it multiple times. I will continue to read it. So, and everyone listening, I'm I'm just telling you, <laughs> you have to get this book. Like, go on Amazon right now and、it's、order this、thing. book, The Little Soul and the Sun. It's the it's, it's absolutely. It's brilliant. So, how did you get introduced to this book, and what does this book mean for you, and and why do you share it with so many people? I do. I I literally, if I care at all about you, you're getting this book. Yeah.、Um, it's it's funny because like I was not raised with any sort of guidance as far as religion or anything like that. You know, my 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 parents were kind of hippies, and they were like, "You're on your own. There's no God." And I was like, "Okay, <laughs> geez, that's pretty scary." So.、Um, Obviously, as I started my healing journey, and you know, I, I've always been very fascinated with the bridge between science and spirituality, and really bridging kind of mathematical truths with with miracle, and kind of seeing how it all fits together. And there's so many questions that we have when we start to heal. Like, okay, I get that I can heal my trauma, and I get that you know, I get that people are are doing the best that they can at their level of consciousness, but Why would my mom do this to me? You know, a little girl, you know, who is just wanting to be loved, who wanted to be, you know, seen and heard. You know, why? Why would I manifest this? Why would I choose this? When you think about the kids that are dying at two years old over cancer, or they're starving in Africa, it's like we have that 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 empathic heart that just bleeds, and we say, why? So it's like we understand universal truths. We understand that God has a purpose for everything. We understand law of attraction. Blah blah blah. But then there's like this humanity part of us that's like, but why, right? Yeah. And and so I would always ask. I was that annoying kid. Why? 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 I was like, you know, stop. And so one day I had opened my first practice when I moved to Kansas City,、um, and I, you know, we had a little like wellness center. And I had a, a beautiful friend who lived downstairs from me. She was a psychotherapist, and I remember one day I was telling her the story of my childhood. And you know, I, I'm I'm a tough girl, and I'm very in touch with my divine masculine, right? I'm a very successful woman, CEO, blah blah blah, very you know tough. And she said to me, she says, "You really need to forgive your mom." And I was like. No,、nah. <laughs> not yet. I'm not ready because I, I, in my mind, in order for me to forgive her, I needed to understand why, and I, it was like that why sent me on such a a journey. Like, was it me? Is, am, am I really a bad girl? Am I really unlovable? Am I unworthy from God's love? And that's really what got me into science. That's what got me into all this work. Is I wasn't really blaming my mom. I was more of like. Why am I like this? Why did I choose this? Why, out of my brothers, was I the one that was abused? So it was like she said, "I have a, a gift for you," and I still have it to this day. It's original. She wrote inside of it, you know, that this book is going to change your life, and when you read it, you're going to understand who you are as not only a soul, but a child of God, and whatever you want to call God, and you know why you embark here and why. Your job is to basically turn pain into purpose. Right. And I mean, I would not have this huge career that I have right now if I didn't have that childhood. I would not 
be able to be compassionate with people's horrible stories that I hear every single day if I did not understand. Yeah. If it's not just about empathy, it's about compassion. And compassion is something from an understanding point. So all the things that I kind of went through as a kid, it, it developed this like understanding. It also made me search, it made me work, it made me look within, it made me ask questions. And if I would have had like a feathered nest growing up, I'd probably be working at TJ Maxx with like six kids. And like, I mean, I'd be kind of happy, but I wouldn't be happy, happy. Right, I wouldn't right. be like in love with my universe the way that I am. Yeah. So this book is, it's, it's, I think this book is answers to your questions. It's profound. It's answers to, <laughs> and the thing is, is so I never read the Bible, but I, I, I love the idea of the truth that sits in that book. Yeah. I just have ADD, so I, I couldn't get through <laughs> it's it. It's a big book to get through. But this is a children's <laughs> book that takes about 10 minutes. I still, to this day, cannot read it without crying. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a touching it book. It is, and I have, I have a, a, an online university that I, that I certify practitioners all over the world. We're in 130 countries, and I have four books in my reading list. That's it. And that is the number one book in my reading list that everyone has to read. And we sit and we go through the parable together because it is so inclusive of anybody's journey, no matter what your belief system is. And it's done so gently that it doesn't disrupt your belief systems. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't like, oh, you I You can don't fit whatever you, you believe fit. into it. Yeah. And it's just, it's so precious. Yeah. That it just immediately opens your heart yeah. to who you are and to who others are to you. Because yeah. we wake up not just through love, but we wake up through pain. Yeah. So if we're all love pretending to be human, then someone loves me enough to hurt me. And that is going to wake me up more than someone telling me they love me. Right. Yeah, when I read the book, I sobbed. I know. And I was I like, knew you would. I was like, what <laughs> is happening? I am reading a children's book mm -hmm. and I am literally being touched in my Serious. inner soul. Yes. Uh yeah, it, it's it's it really is. I have already been telling like everybody, like, you gotta read this book, you gotta <laughs> read this book. Matter of fact, I did, uh, on, on my YouTube channel, I did uh, a couple weeks, a few weeks ago, I read the book. And that's, I, I begged him to do that. You know, he has that voice, <laughs> right? <laughs> Take you to another, another world. Yeah. But to me, it's like to have this book read to you, it, it really kind of activates your inner child. Um, and even, you know, if, you, if you're waiting for the Amazon, go watch his YouTube video because the way that he reads it, like my ent my entire classroom has <laughs> listened to his YouTube oh. channel and shared it with multiple people. Yeah. Because again, it's just like, it's so touching. And you know, to have a book like that read to you is just, it's it's awesome. It's, so I'm really glad you did that. Yeah, no, well, yeah. yes. And you you said I should do it. And I'm yeah. like, okay, so I did it. And I've gotten a lot of feedback. And you did it without it. crying? <laughs> yes. So oddly enough. Because I can't. I had to check out. Yeah, you had to like. I did. When I got to that part, I could feel the emotion coming. Yeah, so I was like, okay, disassociate. Just keep reading. Keep reading. And I got through that that part that was super touching. And once <laughs> yeah. I got to the other side of it, I was like, okay, okay. Yeah, good. I made it. I did it. Uh, yeah, but I thought for a second, yeah, I'm going to have to re-record this yep. because I'm going to lose it. Uh, but I, I, I made it. But it would have been sweet yeah. if you cried. Because, yeah. I mean, I literally, I read every semester. I start, I start my with the reading this book, and every time I get halfway through it, and I'm blubbering, and they're just like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this work so has been, I would imagine, super rewarding for you to oh to work with people and. Well, you know, I I will tell you, it was a selfish journey first, which it should be for all of you. Um, mm. You know, it's not selfishness, it's self-focus. You know. you know, a healed person can help millions of people. You know, if your cup is not full, you're not really going to be able to help very many people. You're just going to bleed yourself out. You're also going to attract the wrong type of people who want help. Yeah. You're going to you become a rescuer. So I always say, you know, work 50, it's 50% 50 service to self, 50% service to others, right? Yeah. And as a practitioner... If I let my own healing go and I just process, process, practice, 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 eventually 
I'm going to be out of balance with me. Yeah. And pain is usually your messenger to come back home to yourself. Pain. Fascinating. Right? So, yes, it's been very rewarding. I mean, I've been able, I mean, every single day, even during the quarantine, I get to work with people in 130 countries. And it's interesting and beautiful because we're all human. So whether I'm talking to Australia or Russia or Italy or, you know, wherever, Canada today, Spain, it's time, health, relationships, and money. It's yeah. like, that's what it is because we're human. We didn't yeah, actually, we, all have the same. we didn't actually come to get to heaven. We came to bring heaven here. Right. And embody that in, in our, on our cells, in our homes, in our relationships, in our abundance in the things we create, in the way that we speak. And we need to bring that here. So it's not about meditating out and losing, jumping out of your body and going living in the clouds and living on a, you know, a mountaintop. Right. It's about being present and taking responsibility for the life that you could have if you got out of your own way. Right. So that's, that's the cool thing is, is I work in a very, like, very, very real space of life like your kids, your husband, like, I don't want to know what spiritual drug you took. I want to know what your relationship is like at home. Right. Because that's the work we have to do because the drug is going to wear off in 20 minutes and then 23 hours of the day, you got to sit and look at him. Right. So I would much rather work on this than that. Right. Because that can get real wooey real quick and it can become an addiction. But if we bring spirituality into science and we bring the magic of the, the, the Holy Spirit in the body, yeah. Or whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, it's like, it's not even joy. It's ecstasy. Yeah. It's like, I'm high on life. I don't take any drugs. I have not needed any drugs. I didn't need any drugs to heal my body. And then when joy returned, it was like joy began to be the engine that began to manifest everywhere else. Right. It was like joyful relationships, joyful home, joyful kids. And it was just like this ripple effect that I didn't have to put effort into. I didn't have to try to be happy. Right. I didn't need something to be happy. It was just like it started to kind of flow through me. And then being able to show up and do this eight hours a day never drains me, never bleeds me out. I never feel like, oh, I can't do this. It's like, it's like I think when people are not doing the work, it's like they're battery operated. And right. when they're doing the work, they're plugged into the wall. It's like this endless current and you never run out of juice yeah. have you noticed that yes yes like when you're talking you just don't run out yeah it's stephen covey's principle of sharpening the saw you know that that's when we sh when we're sharpening the saw it will cut better and mm. quicker and be more I like that um yeah there, there, there's no doubt about it i am uh, personally uh, fueled Mm. Uh, through serving others, but it hasn't it hadn't always been that way for me until I really went through this this healing journey of really going in mm -hmm. and and digging deep and and unraveling those um, <laughs> those things that were so buried and I had built so many mm -hmm. and, I, and what was wild is I always thought I was pretty vulnerable and pretty authentic and everybody always said of me that I was authentic and I was real mm. and I was to a certain extent but there were things that were so buried right uh, and so many padlocks and doors and things that were like had it all tightly packed and covered really nice right um, locked away locked away well I think I think authentic is great but there's a higher vibration than authentic and it's transparent, mm. right? Yeah. So I think that we all go through our authentic phase where we're like, I'm the real deal, right? <laughs> like I'm real, which means I'm going to get divorced. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to, you know, not be the perfect person. You know, it's like you see commercials and it's like authentic. You're like, what are you trying to prove here? Yeah. That you're real, yeah. but transparent is like, you can see all of me, the good, the bad, the ugly, the mistakes, the broken parts. And inside of that, I am whole and I am, I am not real. I am just me. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like the facade of I'm real. I'm real. It's like I, I did a podcast called the death of De death of the ego. And in the death of the ego, it's like a 20 minute podcast that I did. I talk about the stages of enlightenment and how we kind of move 
from this authentic place where we're like, I've arrived, I'm successful. <laughs> and then the dark night of the soul hits you yeah. and your whole life crumbles and you're like, now I'm transparent. Now <laughs> So, like, in my academy, my students know everything about me. Yeah. Everything. Because I use it as a platform of self-awareness. It's like I use my own stories. I use my own metaphors. I use, I use everything in my life as an opportunity to show the reflection of where I'm vibrating. So, if I'm out of alignment, you know, if I'm, if I'm out of alignment, my car will act up. Yeah. Right? What does a car re represent? Div divine masculine freedom. I'm not feeling energetically free right now. So work on that within me. The car gets better. It's weird. Yeah. It's because this is a reflective universe that's getting into the quantum sciences. But that's another conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I can, yeah. I can be in control of my reality all the time that way. And I never have to be like <gasps> worried that the universe is is you know doing something to me because I am the cause and I am the effect. Right. So I look at the effect and then I look for the cause. That's truly taking ownership. That that for me was the the journey where I really began to open up is I I was no longer even the victim of my childhood or the victim of my religious this or the victim of anything. I realized I it's this is this is a <laughs> reflection of me. Like I falls on me. Like literally, I truly can't blame anyone for anything. I, I and the, the book kind of goes into this. That it, everything is about what am I? You know, my perception or my reality or how I'm projecting or it's it's very reflective. You know, how does mm -hmm. this represent me in my life? Right. Um, that was hard to 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 anywhere I look. There was a mirror. <laughs> right. And, and that's perceived selfish. That's perceived narcissist. Right. But when you're on a healing journey, you have to stop being so selfless for a while and catering and rescuing everybody's trauma around you and tend to your own garden and mm. pull your own weeds and replant and germinate and seed. And then when your garden is bountiful, then you can go tend and show other, but it's like. But I could just ignore me and just keep helping everybody else. And because I will tell you, that feels really good. I was a professional rescuer and a professional doormat most of my life. And I found value in that. Yeah. I found a huge value. That's how I loved myself. If I was helping someone else or rescuing someone else or giving someone else money or making someone else feel good about themselves, then through osmosis, I could feel a current of that. But it wasn't real and it didn't stabilize me. I needed another hit. Yeah. And it's funny because rescuers will always need rescuing. Hmm. We think this thought like, I'm going to rescue them and they're going to be good to go and then they're going to rescue me. Interesting. And they don't. Yeah. You're like, you need to be rescued again? I rescued you last <laughs> week. Parents, <laughs> this is for you. Yeah. Your kids, they don't need to be rescued. They need to be guided. Yeah. Right? And I learned this the hard way. When I stopped rescuing people, I actually started having real relationships because you they were one-sided. If yeah. you're a rescuer, if you're constantly the life coach, if you're constantly everybody's mentor, you're doing it for free. You're bleeding yourself out. And it's awesome because you don't have to look at your own stuff. Interesting. But you also become a hypocrite. So if you're always in the teacher role or the yeah. savior role or yeah. the mama role or the daddy role, yep. you're always in that role. That could be your drug of it's ignoring your, your own issues. It's your avoidance. And what will happen is you'll start getting really hypocritical. So like I always say, the ego is very hypocritical. Have you ever heard someone like literally project onto someone else? You watch them do. Yeah. You're like, I watched you do that. And you're saying so-and-so does that, right? And it's like yeah. we become these hypocrites because we start to actually forget about our own trauma. Yeah. But the subconscious speaks through behavior. Yeah. I always say you want to know what's going on in your subconscious. Watch your own behavior for 24 hours from yeah. as an observer. Like, watch, I'm going to work out, you know, I'm going to get up, I'm going to work out in the morning, I'm going to do this today, I'm going to write my journal, I'm going to start my podcast, I'm going to, you know, clean up my house, and then one o'clock, you're driving through the Wendy's, you know, drive through, <laughs> you're Netflixing, you know, you're complaining about someone outside not wearing a mask, you know, it's like, all of a sudden, six o'clock comes, and you're not that person you said you were going to be in the morning, because your behavior just showed you where your trauma was. Yeah. 
That's fascinating. Right? So how often do people break down and cry? Every day. Or, yeah. All the time. People <laughs> always go, every time I see you, I cry. And I'm like, good. That means I'm safe. Yeah. You know, one thing I will tell you about trauma is if you're in a toxic relationship, you're not going to heal that trauma. If you're in a toxic job, you won't be, because you're, it's almost like being around an allergen, you're going to constantly be inflamed. So one of the, the reasons why I opened a wellness center about five or six years ago here in Kansas City was because my intention was to create a safe space to heal. Yeah. Everyone needs a safe space to heal, right? And sometimes your relationship is not safe. Right. Most of the time it's not because they're the trigger. Right, right. So even though you love them, they're still triggering you. So they're not the safe relationship. Mom's not the safe relationship. Your house has become the not safe space. Like your home is not your sanctuary. Social media isn't even a sanctuary because you got haters and all kinds of stuff there. So you have no safe environment. You're in survival. Your nervous system is fight, flight, or freeze, and you can't heal no matter how much podcasting you watch, certifications you do, how many books you read. You can't. So my, the whole purpose behind my work is to create that safe environment. So they're plugged into me. I'm the safe space. We process. I have homework for them. That's the safe space. Yeah. We're in our own little world, no matter what's going on around them. And so they can begin to heal in the hurricane. All they have to do is find the eye of the storm. Yeah. And so my job is to be the eye of the storm until you become the eye of your storm. Yeah. So I will be that for you, or a mentor will be that, or a coach. That's what we. That's that's the power of coaching. That's the power of mentoring. It's, I mean, of course you can do it by yourself. I did it by myself, but it's. I mean, if I had an opportunity to go back, I would definitely do all of this work with someone else. Yeah. Because I would have gone faster. Sure. If there's just things in your blind oh, spots that you yes. need mirrors for. Yeah. Right. Yeah, a lot of my my healing over the last year took place when I. Um, I had a coach. Had a mentor. Yeah, you know, had a mentor and, and did the breath work and it just someone to bring you it. back to yourself. Yes. Because we we literally are constantly sabotaging that. I don't want to go back to myself. I don't want to see what's there. I don't want to feel those feelings. So Which is why this is such a problem. So many people this becomes a drug. This is an addiction. It's just I mean, they're checking everything all the time, all the time. And you know all why? The time. Because if I'm looking at that, I don't have to look at me. Yeah. Right? And I mean you know, it's it's a security blanket, but yeah. when you're really ready, like you said, when I was ready, when you're ready, you'll attract the right teacher, you'll attract the right book, yeah. you'll attract the right mentor, and that person will hold you accountable to yourself until you can be accountable to yourself. And yeah. that's, the, that's the purpose of this, this work we're doing. Yeah. And to me, it's the most valuable work that I could do in this lifetime because of just in the last 10 years to see who I was. And who I've become. And I'm more like the little girl at two years old than I am like a grown up. Yeah. Because I return back to my like factory settings yeah. of joy. Yeah. And now I get to kind of have an adulthood through that perspective and not have to like survive my pain. I right. can use pain as my purpose to teach and heal, but it's not who I am. Right. It doesn't find me. It's not like, oh, okay, got to watch out. I'm crazy because of this. I'm like, no, that crazy is not here anymore. Yeah. Promise. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're at the, the time limit. Uh, how can people find you and, and your YouTube stuff or your uh, university or like whatever? Whatever. How can people find you if they if they want to look you up and... and uh... How can they find me? That's so not my job. Um, well, I have a new website that's going to be launched next week. But for now, I definitely have a website that's sticking up there. Just my name, Jessica Alstrom. YouTube, I've got about six or 700 videos. Everything you could possibly imagine. Twin Flames, you know, podcasts. I've been doing this work for about 10 years now online. Um, I've got Facebook pages. You know, you can just look me up um, on Facebook. I do tons of live videos, just like Timmy all the time, like I'm annoyingly, <laughs> I'm always there <laughs> creeping on you. Um, and then my academy is something that you can find through the website. Um, it's through it's through interview process only, just because of the the depth of the work. I'm not doing private sessions so much anymore, unless I'm really like heart drawn to somebody. But I have um, over 100 practitioners certified all over the world to kind of take my overflow. Um, they've been trained under me to do this real specialized work. And now I'll say that even though I specialize in trauma and um, PTSD, 
the flip side of that is what you get from that is not just oh healing shadow work it's intuition back it's your toolbox it's the heart that is the phd it's your genius it's your joy it's your it's your sensuality it's your truth because the trauma work that we're doing is only to basically pull out the diamond that is in that dark so you know i like to call myself an alchemist because it's like we go into the dark to find the diamond and the diamond is what you get from this process yeah it's like you're not just like oh i'm healing i'm going to therapy no you you have a purpose for this you're uncovering those layers and layers and layers of hard rock so that you can find the true magic inside of you when you bust that open and what what is what is a result of that is you being an extraordinary person not right. being ordinary not right. living a life where you're like like that gut call that's inside of you that is always going to haunt you for the rest of your life you'll actually be able to do something with that you'll have the thoughts the beliefs that you'll be able to take the action you'll be able to follow through you'll stop procrastinating you'll stop self-judging yeah you get out of your own way and you won't even think about it you'll just do it because that pain is not there anymore it's just like when you look at extraordinary people they're so comfortable in their skin yeah. they're so comfortable in their lives you're like how do they do that they've worked through this stuff and that's the byproduct so the byproduct is the magic it's the miracle it's the happiness it's the abundance you guys money is a, is if you're blocked with money it's trauma yeah. it's not because you don't deserve it you know you don't have to do anything on this planet to deserve abundance you just have to be people think i got to do 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 we're human beings not human doings right so the when you are really yourself you vibrate this frequency and you become a magnet to money to magnet to love but you got to get out of your own way cuz right now you're actually pushing it away but you don't realize you're doing it right and that's oftentimes you hear people talk about you know i just sabotage my own relationships i sabotage my relationships it's like i find a way every time to sabotage my right. relationships right i have to reject you before you reject me right I have to abandon you before you abandon me or I have to let you abandon me to prove that you're going to abandon me. Right. You see how that yeah, works? That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, this is great. This is one of the, one of my favorite interviews that I've actually done on the show. I mean, a lot of great interviews, but uh, I I felt <laughs> Well, mm -hmm. I I feel like you you tapped into uh, uh, something that people that's holding people back from their mm -hmm. full self and you know it's like what dr phil says how's that working for you <laughs> you know I, that's such a great line you know like like how is your love life how is your money life how is right. your relationship with right. money or your relationship with so if there it is speaks. something yeah, yeah it's speaking to you right and you can't deny it so when you know someone comes online with me and it's like oh i always say how are you doing and they're like good and i'm like really how's that how how's this how's that and they're like oh no yeah, not cuz it's like we're so programmed. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. We're, we're so I'm trained good. to survive pain that we don't even know we're in pain. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I didn't know how good I could feel, how yeah. whole I could feel until, you until felt it. right. It's it's and the same thing with when when I really started eating healthy. I was like, I never <laughs> yeah, but, realized I wasn't is, feeling that great. You know, there's an essence of you loving yourself that is the only way you would eat well. Right. Because someone who doesn't love themselves doesn't eat well. Right. So you if you see how everything just kind of happens organically. Yes. I like myself, so of course I want to feed myself well. Right. You know? Yeah. It's like you love your kids, you feed them super good and then you eat trash, right? right. But it's it's like it's a self-love thing. Right. So when you love yourself, of course you're going to eat better. Right. If you don't, you're going to eat well for a few weeks and then and go then, right back. Pff, off the wagon. That's interesting. We, we need to do another interview. Yeah. Well, well, there's all kinds of topics. Yeah. Well, I'll, sure. I'll pick another topic and we'll We'll do this again. You know what I would love to do with you, Timmy, is, you know, because you've been in the dating world for a long time. I've been in the dating world. Like, actually break down all of the wounding and all of the trauma that we are are throwing our inside the dating world and, and then feeling like there's no good men out there. There's no good women out there. And I hear that all, all the, time. the time. All the time. Right? I'll never find anybody. And maybe like, we could well, give them like 10 tips of stuff that they could work on so that if they're, you know, you're out there on the dating apps and you're trying to find your soulmate and like what you're actually doing wrong and yeah. how you can flip it and try something else and and use yourself as a research. I mean, you got nothing but time right now, right? right? <laughs> Now's the time. Time to do is it. now. 
Right, because yeah. I love that whole, I got ghosted, I got ghosted, and I'm like, I'm going to have to dive into that one. And when I actually dove into it, I saw a pattern. And everything, you can always find a pattern. Yeah. And it's interesting to see where that manifests from because it's actually, you're getting ghosted, but it's coming from you. That's fascinating. I know. I love this. All right, so Jessica Alstrom, we're going to do another interview. We're going to talk about that stuff okay, yeah, and probably more. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, make sure to click the uh, subscribe button so that you can be notified anytime I do a video. Uh, I'll be doing more, more videos with this girl here for sure. We've got a lot of stuff to talk, talk about and cover. Uh, be safe and take care of yourself and those around you and vibrate love at all times. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>